Anyone who's ever been near Lake Superior during a storm knows how deadly it can be. For many years in the early history of Marquette, anyone who was trapped on the lake and needed rescue relied upon the Marquette Station of the Life-Saving Service. Fred Stonehouse, a nationally renowned maritime historian, tells us local officials lobbied to have the Life-Saving Service establish a station here. Marquette was a major point of shipping activity on Lake Superior. And as a major point, it also suffered its fair share of significant maritime accidents, disasters, shipwrecks, and death. And it became very apparent to local civic leaders that we needed to get assistance here. We needed to get a, a, a station for the U.S. life-saving service right in the city of Marquette to be able to deal with our deluge of, of maritime tragedy. So a group from the city, including Peter White, would lobby the federal government to establish a station here, and they did that in April of uh, 1889. The Congress agreed. The, uh, the management uh, and leadership of the life-saving service itself agreed, and the station was constructed here that opened in the spring of 1891. It was under the command of a very veteran life-saving keeper, Captain uh, Henry J. Cleary. Under the command of Captain Cleary, the life-saving service was responsible for some amazing acts. During the period of operations, Henry J. Cleary established new records for this station in terms of efficiency, proficiency, and the ability to save human life. And a wonderful example occurred in September of 1895 when the big wooden steamer Charles J. Kershaw ended up going on Chocolate Reef just off where today's state prison is located. When she went up, she broke her back, a uh, terrific gale going on. It was absolutely necessary to get the crew off that vessel, and the lifesavers came to the rescue, and in what has been considered to be the most daring small boat rescue ever performed on Lake Superior by the Life Saving Service, Cleary was able to get all 16 men safely off that vessel. Fred says the members of the life-saving service were a rare breed of individuals, not just physically, but also in how they approached a dangerous job. They never knew when they would be called out. Just behind me, on the grounds of the life-saving station, there would be a lookout tower that would be manned 24 hours a day. And that lifesaver in the tower had the responsibility of keeping track of all the maritime traffic within his point of view. If he saw a shipwreck happening, if he saw a, a signal from perhaps a lifesaver on shore, or from any citizen that said, there's a shipwreck happening, we need your help, he immediately would sound the bell that would summon all of the crew. The crew were on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They could be in the vicinity of the station, but they had to be able to immediately response, or respond. Depending on the type of rescue that was required, Cleary would either use a small surf boat about 26 foot long and about 900 pounds, or the big lifeboat that was uh, 34 feet long and weighing in at about 4,000 pounds. And those would usually be launched from the boathouse directly, be, directly really in front of me right on the harbor where today's Coast Guard station is located. And they would row that boat through hail and storm or whatever necessary to get to the shipwreck site and make the rescue. When I use the term row out, they did indeed. And they would be able to do that for a distance of perhaps 10 or 15 miles, turn around and come back. The men were incredibly strong. They were well conditioned. They were people that had to be able to do heavy work, do it well, and do it repetitively as a member of a team. Not to use the analogy uh, too lightly, but much as the basketball team will have certain plays that they'll perform on the court and do it perfectly to score the, uh, score the points, the lifesavers in the act of saving human life would do exactly the same thing. It wasn't just rescue work being done by members of the life-saving service. Captain Cleary would also lead the team on exhibitions to show off their very impressive skills. One of the methods they would use to show off, if you will, to advertise their ability and, and frankly, the lobby Congress for additional funding, too, was to appear at each of the great national expositions that were being held in the country, uh, beginning about the 1893 in the Chicago Columbian Exposition. And the man that, that was chosen to take a picked crew of lifesavers to the great expositions, including Chicago, and to operate from a created station. They would build a life-saving station right at the grounds of whatever festival it was. There would always be a large body of water available, so they would bring their lifeboat. 
and uh, using men coming from eight different stations, Cleary would mold them into one functioning crew, and they would do things like the, uh, the boat drill. And that's the wonderful tape that Jack Dio has been able to salvage for us, where they are taking the, the surf boat, not the big lifeboat, but the smaller surf boat, rolling it over, and then riding it and riding it again. And it is said that in his younger days, Cleary would be able to dance across the boat and never get wet. The life-saving service was eventually folded into the Coast Guard in 1915. Captain Cleary was the only commander the Marquette Station ever had. And according to Fred Stonehouse, the legacy they left was one of unsung heroes. A lighthouse keeper had two jobs. Job one, turn the light on. Job two, turn the light off. That was it. Anything else he did was purely secondary. Whereas it was the life-saving service that had that very difficult job of putting their own lives at deep risk to save the lives of others, so others may live. The motto of the life-saving service, which was regulations say we have to go out, they say nothing about coming back. And in the Great Lakes as a whole, 44 lifesavers gave their lives in the line of duty trying to live up to that motto.